The Sega Dreamcast had a short but explosive life filled with great software while it was supported. It's extremely easy to find lists and recommendations for the platform's better games, particularly those that were exclusive at the time. But what about the rest of the games? Were any of the multi-platform games worth your time? That's what we are going to take a look at in this episode. I've picked 10 multi-platform titles that I think moved over to the Dreamcast quite well, with some getting heavy bumps and visuals on top of it. I've got sports games, racing games, a 3D platformer, and even a game that was part of the series that inspired Resident Evil, itself inspired by Resident Evil. I hope you guys enjoy multi-platform Dreamcast games worth playing. In September of 2000, Midway published NFL Blitz 2001 on the Dreamcast. This title did for American professional football what NBA Jam did for NBA games. It's based on the series that began life in the arcade in 1997, and then saw numerous ports to home systems thereafter. The Dreamcast version here is 7 on 7, ultra fast and violent as hell. Late hits, pass interference, it's all fair game in this one. The gameplay is designed to allow you to get downfield as quickly as possible. You have spin moves, hurdles, and a turbo at your disposal to assist you, and all the things that slow down the contest have been eliminated or abbreviated to make this the fastest game of gridiron on the market. It looks good, runs great, and the timeless gameplay does not suffer the way many of the simulation-based sports games often do. If you even remotely enjoy football, this is a game very much worth looking into. It also has a season and tournament mode should you want something beyond the arcade. It supports four players, has created team and player options, and was by far the best version of this title available. There was also an entry the previous year called NFL Blitz 2000. Midway was also responsible for NBA Showtime, NBA on NBC, a polygon update of their NBA Jam and Hangtime style of games. I was always a fan of the fast and easy to get into arcade style of the series, and NBA Showtime here takes that formula and pushes the presentation through the roof. Two on two basketball featuring four simultaneous players make this one of the very best party games of all time. The visuals are sharp fast, smooth, and still manage to look great most of the time. The gameplay is as easy to get into as any sports title I've played, and you'll be dunking and nailing three-pointers in no time. It's light on modes, but the fun factor is so high you won't care. Again, it smokes the PlayStation and Nintendo 64 versions that also came home, and has a nearly universal appeal to anyone who enjoys a quick game of b-ball. Houston, we have liftoff. Miami by a point. He loses it. Takes off. Dishes to Howard. He loses it. Going high. Oh, did he shake him or what? In December of 1999, we got Wetrix Plus, a falling piece puzzle game that originally appeared on the Nintendo 64. Your job is to build walls to contain water on a flat surface. Contain the water in lakes and try not to let anything leak off the side. You get different shapes of walls, pieces that lower the ground, and fireballs to evaporate the water. This is how you gain big points and keep things going. It's not as easy as it sounds and it is quite unique among puzzle games. The presentation is super simple, so the gameplay is the entire focus of the experience. I pulled this one out from time to time trying to improve my skills, and the gameplay you see here was my daughter trying her hand at it. There is a simple addiction to it, and once you get the hang of it, it can be quite entertaining. It has split-screen multiplayer and a really hard challenge mode as well. In 2000, the Dreamcast received a port of V-Rally 2 called Test Drive V-Rally in North America. 
I was so happy when this came out. I had been somewhat let down by the poor port of Sega Rally 2 on the machine, so when another rally game showed up, I was eager to fire into it. While this lacks the refinement of a Sega racer, it's no less a blast to play. You can adjust a bunch of things on your car to make it handle exactly how you want it, and the uneven surfaces go well beyond what we saw in Sega's effort. The performance is mostly solid and the visuals are sharp and detailed, though you will notice some jarring polygon pop up here and there. The only real negative I have for this one is that the physics engine can sometimes get wonky and do weird things, but aside from that, this is a great off-road racing title that has loads to offer fans of the genre. This one received a PC release that same year, but it absolutely blows away the PlayStation version. It supports up to four players. In September of 2000, we also got a port of San Francisco Rush 2049. This is one of those games I am simply no good at. I want to be, I try to be, but often I am relegated to last place or pretty close to it. Despite my abysmal performance, I really enjoy the jumps, shortcuts, and crashes of this one. And if you can get three other friends to play with you, it can drain hours of your time easily. The Rush series was an arcade staple in the 1990s and this was definitely one of the better home ports of it at the time. It's much sharper and smoother than the Nintendo 64 version, and while it has aged quite a bit, I still think it looks decent. Arcade, stunt, practice, and ghost modes are here to mess around with, making sure you have plenty to do with this great arcade port. Treasure showed up with a heck of a unique shoot 'em up called Bangayo in 1999. Seriously, I've never played anything like it. You are this tiny little mech with two pilots that have their own weapons. You must navigate the stage, gaining bonus items and destroying enemy mechs and bosses. The visuals here are simple but loaded with tons of little effects, and it does get quite challenging. It's actually a really simple game to get into but the 40 plus stages ensure you have a ton to do. There is a Nintendo 64 version of this that doesn't look as nice and has a different manner of charging your special attacks and can only attack 100 targets versus the Dreamcast 400. Some stages are wide open while some are much tighter and require far more strategy. It's an all around unique multi-directional shooter that really had no peers at the time. It received a few sequels on the Nintendo DS and Xbox 360 a few years later. One of the games that inspired the Resident Evil franchise was Alone in the Dark. With Capcom series doing so well, it made sense that we got a brand new Alone in the Dark called The New Nightmare in 2001. Edward Carnby and his partner must investigate the death of a friend on Shadow Island, and as the name suggests, all kinds of crazy stuff is going on there. Your plane is attacked, you are split up, and of course it all goes to hell. You can choose which character to start with and each one goes about the adventure quite a bit differently. It follows the first few Resident Evil games almost to a T. Tank controls, fixed camera angles, and even the gameplay is copy and paste for exploration and combat. This engine is actually quite good too, with a heavy focus on using your flashlight to find your way around. The story is decent and the setting is about as creepy as it gets in these kinds of games. It doesn't have the polish of Capcom's efforts and there is a big contrast in the appeal of the enemies, but it's still very much worth playing.
I really enjoyed the Twisted Metal games on the PlayStation, so I naturally gravitated towards the Vigilante 8 series, a very similar car combat game that saw a sequel show up on the Dreamcast in 1999 called Vigilante 8 Second Offense. You know the drill here, drive around, collect weapons and let them loose against the other drivers. Each driver has a different vehicle that has different stats like speed and toughness. You get stage dangers that you need to stay wary of as well. I like this game, but it does have a few things holding it back from greatness. The stage design is nowhere near the level of the Twisted Metal games, and while it is sharper and smoother than the other console releases, it's still filled with ugly textures that lack detail. Still, its four-player mode and lack of similar car combat games on the system make this one very much worth a look. In early 2000, the Dreamcast got one of the best 3D platformers of that generation, Rayman 2 The Great Escape. Your world has been invaded by evil pirates and you need to run, jump, swim, collect items and free all of your friends. This gorgeous world runs extremely smooth and outside of the excellence of Mario 64, you will not find a better playing 3D platformer from the era. There is so much to see and discover. Every nook and cranny has something hidden away. An overworld map allows you to revisit areas to get the stuff you missed, and there are tons you are likely to have missed the first time through. As usual, this version was sharper and its performance better than any other console editions at the time. Even the later released PlayStation 2 game didn't run as well. This is my favorite game of this type on the platform, and a must own if you collect Dreamcast games. I included this one because it was such an incredible surprise in 2000. Miss Pac-Man Maze Madness is a puzzle and maze game that completely turns the usual formula on its head. Instead of just eating dots and ghosts, here you must find keys, move blocks, hit switches, and find your way around. The Pac-Man gameplay has never been so deep and full of surprises. There are even things you need to collect as you explore. As an added bonus, you get the original arcade version of Miss Pac-Man as well. It's easy to pick up and play for almost anyone since there are no buttons to press and there is a four-player mode to bring the family along. I really like how this turned out and it's the type of game that most people would pass up in an instant thinking it was shovelware. Not so, it's a great take on a classic gameplay formula and adds enough to make Miss Pac-Man brand new once again. If I had to tell you one thing about these games that is a weakness across the board, it would be that they are indeed products of multi-platform development. None of these really take advantage of the system the way the exclusives did, and they all could have looked better in some way. The trade-off is that most of them are really smooth and play great because of it, and I'll take that enhancements over nothing at all. Every one of these has a core gameplay quality that is strong enough to recommend, and a few are so good you just have to own them. Multi-platform games are often seen as the weakest link in any given library, with exclusives commanding the lion's share of recommendations and critical praise. Every so often though, a company would hit all the right notes and make a game sing no matter how many platforms it was ported to. I think you should give these games a go if you haven't, or revisit them if it's been a while since you have. I'm Sigalord X, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.